How's everyone doing? I'm Questlove, director of Summer Soul, and we are here in Mount Morris Park in the heart of Harlem, later christened Marcus Garvey Park in 1973. This right here is the epicenter where one of the greatest, most powerful music festivals occurred back in 1969, the Harlem Cultural Festival. Welcome to the Harlem Cultural Festival. So many luminaries came together from B.B. King, Gladys Knight the Pips, Stevie Wonder, Sly and the Family Stone, Hugh Masekela, Nina Simone, Moms Mabley, Willie Tyler and Lester. There was Max Roach and Abby Lincoln, just Latin music, African music. So many artists that came here to use the power of music to heal people. Perfect. What's up? How you doing? How you doing, Questlove? Man, an honor to 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 talk to you. Um, so 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 first, I'm gonna just get right into it. Like now, you join um, a, a a long line of artists from the hip hop world, where you go to RZA or Master P or Fifty Cent or Ice Cube. Mm -hmm. They got into that director's chair, and um, I want to know, like like, how much of a a learning curve was it for you to to get behind, to get into the director's chair? Um, you know, uh, what's weird is that, um, you know, in, in 2016, I had, I, I'd written Creative Quest where I kind of encouraged people to um, sort of embrace other areas of creativity because I'm trying to prove the theory that Creativity is transferable. So, you know, if you are a composer, you can be a, a culinary food expert also, and you can write fiction. And it's so weird that um, when it came to this film, when I was initially approached uh, to do it, I was I was instantly, uh, it's the first time in my creative life that I was like putting the brakes on it. Whereas anything else, I kind of embraced that challenge like, hell yeah, I'll do it. You know, and this time it was sort of like, uh, I don't know, y'all, this might not be me. Um, and so, you know, my girlfriend had to remind me that, you know, you actually wrote a book on this. So now it's, <laughs> now it's time for you to take your own advice. So um, yeah, in the very beginning, I think I, I was maybe slightly overwhelmed with the thought of being the person that gets to correct history. So this was way beyond like, oh, my first movie. This is like, you better not mess this up. Like, this is our history. We better tell the story correctly. So um, yeah, I'll say it took me about a good three months to finally like uh, uh, thaw me out and me to accept responsibility that, okay, now it's time. When you look at the audience, could see the change in the scene as it was happening. There would still be people in silk and wool and shark skin, but you would see the bell bottoms, the cut-off shirts. You saw platform shoes, hip huggers, men wearing no shirt and leather vests. It was hip. Yeah, it was real hip. At that time, Harlem was a melting pot of black style. When we got into the late 60s, there was a new movement, Afrocentric. It's a revolution, style revolution, cultural revolution. We found that the African styles just suit us better. I can remember dashikis. Everybody had a dashiki. I think I had a dashiki. Now, the dashiki is an adaptation of an African piece. What we mean when we say dashiki is freedom. Uh, so it's a freedom suit. I can move in any direction. I never am attacked. The hair was the biggest change. Afros. My generation say it looks nice. The older generation thinks it's ridiculous. I'm guessing like the biggest challenge, other than getting over that initial hump of um, wearing a different creative hat, must have been going through all that footage. I mean, six weeks, a six week music festival must have been so much footage to sift through and decide which one's gonna make the make the yeah. cut and what's gonna be on the cutting room floor. Like, um, what were some of those hard decisions on what you couldn't put into the to the the film? All right, so uh, in in a major amateur move, I'll say that my first draft 
was like three, three hours and 25 minutes. So um, I'll say that getting rid of 90 minutes of footage, especially with everything. So, you know, we cut it. So, uh, you know, micro cutting that it wasn't like, I mean, the longest thing that we could lose was like, uh, well, we took the comedy segment out because in order for the comedy to really, really, truly make sense and hit it home, it's almost like you'd have to spend maybe somewhere between 15 to 20 minutes explaining the history of black comedy from the beginnings of minstrelsy all the way to that point. Um, so that was, that was probably like the most long and involved uh, history lesson that kind of took you out of the concert. And so um, we got rid of that altogether, not to mention um, kind of the, 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 the area of deciding whether to include the hit single or the best performance. So that was hard to do. Cause you know, obviously by that point, Stevie wonder had monster number one hits. Like, you know, for once in my life, uh, you know, he just written, if you really love me, um, my Sharia more like he had like major, major hits by that point. But to me, the one performance that pointed to what Stevie Wonder's life was, was going to be for the next 25 years was like Shooby Doo Da Day, which was like a minor single. But that was sort of like the inkling of what was going to be there. So, I mean, Chambers Brothers did like a 14 minute version of, of Time. B.B. King did this really awesome uh, Baby Don't You Worry uh, that's like nine minutes long with this dialogue he does with Lucille, the guitar. So, I mean, you know, there was a lot of songs I had to drop. Like the entire Nina Simone set to me was worthy of, of inclusion. But, you know, I felt like I would grab more people um, with something, you know, shorter and quicker. So I've, I've learned about the art of editing and how shorter stories are more impactful than trying to pack everything into, yeah. you know, that sort of thing. When you look at music festivals today, I mean, I know this this played such a, I mean, it was such a pivotal time in our history, um, you know, culturally and, and, and a, a, growth, a growth spurt for us um, going on at the moment. But when you look at the Coachellas and the the well, one of my favorite events that that no longer happens is the Roots Jam session that used to happen uh, during Grammy Week, mm -hmm. and I know you do Roots. Pick still doing it. I mean, <laughs> well, I guess I, I just don't get the invite no more, then, bro. I guess that's oh, fault, bro. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's still happening. <laughs> Awkward. No, I'm playing. <laughs> um, but, you but, know the the difference between now. Here's a here's a weird thing. Um, when we were making Do You Want More, we made, um, we made a decision to exile, to creatively exile to, um, to Europe. And we got an apartment in the UK only because we knew that Europe had understood what fest the power of the festival. You know, by that point in the Roots career, like in, in 1993, all America had was Lollapalooza. And that's it, you know, I mean, an occasional farm aid. Um, but it wasn't like live aid was every year. And, you know, this is not to discount Al Heyman's Budweiser Superfest either, um, which to me is more like a, a, a super concert series. Like I don't count like radio stations ho hosting like power jams, you know, which is like a bunch of artists of the day coming out. But, you know, this this is really the first time that black people are getting they're a festival, something that's close to what the Newport um, Jazz Festival was for jazz lovers and also like um, all those folk festivals, like the fact that Bob Dylan went electric uh, in 1965 and almost caused a riot there because he wasn't playing an acoustic guitar. It's like, how dare you play electric? Um, you know, the, the America was just getting accustomed to the idea of gathering in large numbers um, you know, unless you were the Beatles playing Shea Stadium, like, you know, the, as an artist, like your hope 
was basically to play Madison Square Garden. Like that was the limit to what where people saw. And the fact that over 300,000 people during that summer got to see this festival. Um, it was unprecedented at the time, you know? Yeah. It, it seems like in this last year, of course, uh, of course we dealt with a pandemic that, you know, killed a lot of people worldwide, but just like as a lover of uh, the genre, a lover of hip hop, it seems we, we lost a lot of, you know, big namesakes in the hip hop, um, mm -hmm. hip hop, world uh you know shock g and 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 dmx and and, right. and we even have biz Markey that's not uh doing well right now and I, I pray that everything happens and then and then um um malik b also i mean uh how do you i mean what are we just at this time where where hip-hop has grown up this you know for this many years that we should expect that we're that we're losing these legends or did this year kind of seem like kind of we well, we no, should, weird. you know, since since 1994, sadly, it's like we've lost since 1994 or really 1991. I'll start with MC Trouble and Cowboy from the Furious Five. It's almost like it's almost expected that there is to be somewhere between two to five names that we lose every year. Um, you know, and what I'm now seeing because it's, it's weird because there was a part of my life where I felt like you know before the age before the age of, of 30 like when you're in your 20s um, to me the whole point of my life was not to get shot in the club so basically I avoided the club like unless I was DJing there which you're protected you go in through the back door right to your car whatever like I was never like, oh, let's go to the club tonight because I, always in the back of my head, I'm like, mm -mm, I'd be trouble in the club. Don't go there. So there's a point where you get like 33, 34, 35, and you kind of do this collective sigh of, Whew, okay, I survived that. And none of us were prepared for the new getting shot in the club, which is uh, the situation of our health. Um. And so what you're watching is you're watching the result of kind of the uh, over celebratory uh, kind of lifestyle choices that a lot of us made, you know, because the thing is that the we call that term eating good, like as far as like celebrating um and being festive and kind of living life to the till quote till the wheels fall off. And now our bodies are starting to speak to us, you know, about you got to take care of us more. And, you know, even I fell down that dangerous road where, um, you know, I, I wouldn't go to the hospital to look, get looked at, you know, like that whole Chris Rock Tussin thing, like, you have to be on your deathbed before you say, okay, I'm going to go to the hospital and see what's wrong and get my health together. So yeah, a lot of us are, are getting that wake up call right now. Um, you know, and, and it's a struggle. It is, it is an absolute struggle to figure out what one should do with their life now that their hip hop prime is over. So in doing like summer of soul, um, you know, last year I was confronted with like, what are we going to do? Like, what if I never step on stage again? What if I never DJ in a club again? Like, what's my life going to be now that I'm 50? And so for me, the, the, the uncomfortable pivot of being in a position where like doing this film actually was very therapeutic for me. Um, and yes, I was really uncomfortable with wearing, a, everyone's uncomfortable with a new pair of shoes, but um, I realized that even for my own mental health or whatever, like I have to embrace other forms of creativity and not to say, well, I was a drummer and I'm gonna die a drummer. No, like we have to figure out what we're doing with our lives now. And the things that we used to do when we were in our twenties, we can't do anymore. Yeah. yeah. There's always this conversation about, you know, greatest rapper alive and everything else. And um, it seems like, you know, Black thought is not, you know, talked about enough in that thing. I think like real hip hop heads know that black thought is is, is up there, but 
Um, wh why is he an underdog in this way? When obviously he's been one of the best lyricists of all time, along with the Roots being one of the best bands of any genre of all time. You know, I'll say at the end of the day, um, I didn't realize it coming in the gate. I mean, the Roots never had, the, the one thing that the Roots didn't have that every other successful MC had was sort of like a, a, a winner's narrative. I won, I won, which, you know, we, we were raised sort of on uh, the kind of hip hop that was more inclusional. So like if Run DMC says like my Adidas, you're thinking to yourself, oh, I can get Adidas like those guys and be cool like those guys. But then something happened in 1997 where suddenly there's this invisible velvet rope. And now it's like, nah, see, this is what I have. And you can't have this. You can't have this boat. You can't have this mansion. You can't talk to these. Like it's, it's almost like we became exclusionary in 1997 and you know of course that would have been like the fourth year that the roots was out and kind of playing from an old manual like we never once thought to brag about like how we made it and you didn't but we made it that sort of thing um and that's what hip-hop sort of became and you know what's weird enough is that one of the things that forced me to do this movie was the fact that um i too was hope kind of hopeless and and find and and that hip hop finds its footing again that it's once again the voice of of the community and exclusionary and and inclusionary of of people in the community not just for like the winner circle like the fact that the winners get the loudest microphone and the biggest reach um, has sort of became hip hop's narrative. And, you know, hip hop started as a culture that was for the voiceless. And so what I'm hoping is that people will see this movie and realize how important it is that they use their voice for um, kind of activism. I think a lot of people, time, you know, a lot of times people just are sh gun shy to do so because they feel it's like, you know, I'm not a real leader and I'm not a politician. I just want to make money, you know, have fun. And why does the burden have to be on me? And they're right. The burden shouldn't have to be on us. And yes, I'm, I'm talking from a reluctant leader standpoint. I mean, every day I wake up and it's like, ugh, I'm a leader. Ugh, like that. So even I'm coming to grips with the fact that as a 50 year old who's now a director, everything I do should reflect, uh, leadership and so you know hopefully you know we're making our new album right now and mm -hmm. Tariq is still the most consistent he's never waned on his talent or squandered a verse or anything um you know I, I definitely feel as though people will eventually pay attention like we're not going to ever dumb down our quality so um as long as we have the drive to make quality music um we will find an audience well, I was excited to hear about this uh, documentary, and I, and I loved it after watching it and just hearing that the Roots got a new album. My heart just jumped. I'm not <laughs> even gonna lie; I'm not, I'm not bull BSing you at all. Like, like the Roots have a I'm good sure. album coming out. Yes, we 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 have an excellent album coming out. But, but I look forward to everything you're doing, man. I hope you direct more and just keep on uh, exploring your your creative genius and in, in, in all its forms and. Uh, Good luck to you and everything, man. And congratulations on this project. And can't wait to go to the next jam session. Thank so you. Let me get the invite. Yes, we will make sure you're invited. Yes, absolutely. All right. Thank you, Questlove. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Okay.